My family has owned a jewelry store here in New Orleans since 1952. My grandfather opened it up after spending most of his life working on a farm outside of Baton Rouge. Having saved up for years to be able to afford the lease. He haggled upon shops and thrift stores, building up a fine collection of chains, brooches, and rings that he could turn a profit on. He built that business from the ground up, transforming it from a struggling, run-down old dump and the one in New Orleans' most successful jewelry stores. When he retired, he handed the thing off to my dad, who he trained up throughout his teenage years and early 20s. Then when my turn came, the tradition continued. I learned how to evaluate gold and silver checking for purity and such like while other kids were finishing high school and going off to college. I was learning the jeweler trade, more than 50 years of hard work got poured into that place. Three generations of Louisiana blood and we were all extremely proud of it. But over the course of about 48 hours in August 2005, we almost lost everything when Hurricane Katrina hit the city. And as it turned out, the actual hurricane was the least of our worries. Fortunately for my family, the suburb of New Orleans that we lived in at the time was just above the waterline. So we didn't get much in the way of flooding out where we lived. Sure, the winds and the rain were pretty scary. But I didn't start to really worry until I heard about all the looting going on downtown, and how there was absolutely nothing in the way of law enforcement. I couldn't just sit there and watch it happen on the news. So I got in my car and headed towards downtown with my pistol on the passenger seat. When I reached the area where the water started to accumulate, I parked up my car got out and began to slosh to the floodwater, Towards the street my stores on who was horrible seeing the city I was raised in having been so utterly destroyed and it didn't take long before I started to see evidence of the looting. I saw a guy with about 10 pairs of jeans slung over his shoulder wading through the water about 100 meters or so ahead of me and didn't say a thing. Not because it was now raged, but because he held a small revolver up high just letting everyone know that he wasn't about to be stopped. I reached my store and thank God that it hadn't been broken into. But the inside was almost totally wrecked. I set about collecting up every valuable item that I could intended to take it all up into the safe of the second floor where hopefully it would be safe from any looters that came by the rent. As I was in the middle of doing so, I heard the sound of the boat engine just outside along with a bunch of angry sounding voices. As soon as I turned around, I saw a masked man pointing a rifle at me through the wrought iron gating that I used to lock up my store. He screamed at me to drop the pistol marking me that he'd shoot me dead if I didn't comply. I knew if I did, that'd be the end of my store, but he started counting down from five like he was going to pull the trigger when he got to zero. So I did. I dropped my gun into the water and watched as what appeared to be a well-organized team of looters wrenched open the old iron gates in the crowbar and proceeded to break into my store. They were well-armed, well-equipped, and all of them had body armor on to like they'd seen the destruction of the chaos and just decided to take full advantage of it all. It terrified me that predators like that seemed to walk among us. One had a pistol to my head as the rest commenced to smashing the glass cabinets and emptying the contents in the plastic bags. I had a watch while they pretty much emptied the entire store. But even when they'd taken almost everything they weren't satisfied. The guy with the pistol in my head started demanding I tell him where the rest was that he knew I had a bunch more jewelry stashed away somewhere along with some cash. He was right. But I lied and told them they empty me out. That's when he started dunking my head under the water for longer and longer periods of time, telling me sooner drown me than walk away at that point. It was pure torture. I felt like I was going to black out. So in the end, I just told them about the safe upstairs. They dragged me onto the second floor and held that gun to my head as they made me unlock the safe and then empty the entire thing into plastic bags that they were carrying. Almost five grand worth of cash and jewels are gone just like that. Then as quickly as they had arrived, they left and completely emptied me out. I'd gone downtown to protect my store and I failed miserably. It was one of the most terrifying humiliating experiences my life, but I'm glad I was able to walk away with my life. It took a while before the store was up and running again. 
I had a fight with insurance companies who seemed unwilling to pay out, some claiming an act of God or some other nonsense. But in the end, we didn't lose the store entirely and we're open for business again. Although there's not a day that goes by that I don't see that guy's face. Or remember how that floodwater tasted when an evil sob almost drowned me and my own store. For the longest time now my one true passion in life has been fishing. I have a really high-pressure job as a stock trader in my hometown of Philadelphia. And nothing seems to help me unwind from a stressful week, quite like a day's worth of fishing. I think it's the combination of the serene setting, the slow, steady pace of it and the fact that I'm reconnecting with nature, when most of my life is spent in a stuffy office space, staring at a computer screen. But there's always been one dream fishing trip that I've always wanted to go on, but never really had the time to arrange. And that's bow fishing down in Louisiana. Ever since I saw a segment on its on the World Fishing Network, I was just dying to try it. I always wanted to try out some kind of archery too. So combining that with my passion for fishing just seemed like the obvious choice. I had mentioned that once or twice to the wife and being the great listener that she is. She ended up arranging a trip down into the bayou for myself and a few of my buddies for my 37th birthday. We flew down to New Orleans on that Friday morning, which I had no idea was named after Louis Armstrong, then spent the day hanging around Bourbon Street drinking cocktails and soaking up the jazz. Then after finding the hangovers the next day, we drove down along the Mississippi River to this little place called Boris, where we found ourselves at No Labau Fishing Charters. The guys down there were awesome, sharing all their little tricks and techniques with us to ensure we'd have as lucrative a trip as possible. Then, once the sun had set, we loaded up into the boat and set off into the swamps. It really was like a dream come true to me. The landscape down there really is something to behold. But here's the thing. The shallow bottom boat we were on had these floodlights on them just below the waterline. Most fishermen will tell you that this is basically cheating, since the fish tend to be attracted to the lights like that at nighttime. But since we were using bows and arrows, I guess it kind of evened out the odds. However, having lights on your boat, like that, totally ruins your night vision. So as much as you can see the waters around you perfectly clearly, it blinds you to the darkened areas beyond. And that makes you feel pretty vulnerable. Indeed, that could have been anything out there in the darkness, just watching us, and we'd have absolutely no idea was there. So we're eventually having a ball for the first hour or so. Mostly just making fun of each other for missing our shots so much. But eventually, we actually started getting the hang of the whole accuracy thing. We're pulling in all kinds of black drums, redfish and flounder, which are absolutely delicious, by the way, but I couldn't see any of the one fish I wanted to shoot. And that was an alligator gar. I'd had my heart set on getting my hands on a big 10-footer to show the guys back at the office, and I was worried the entire trip might pass before I got a chance to shoot one. But eventually one of my buddies is looking over the side of the boat into the brightly lit but murky waters when when he calls out to me that he sees this big old gar hiding among some reach just a few feet away. He knew I was after one as was everyone so everyone got out of the birthday boy his way so I could get a clear shot on it. So there I was right up on the edge of the boat with my bow and arrow and hand trying to steady myself to get a good aim on the scar. God this thing was huge. I mean, it was easily a ten-footer, the same exact kind of monster that I'd been dreaming of getting my hands on. And I really had to regulate my breathing to keep my hands from shaking too much. Only just as I start to get ready to aim on the thing. And I'm about to fire the air on the water. It starts to slowly creep further away from the boat. Almost like the thing knew I had my eyes on it. But I wasn't about to let it get away. And as dumb as this was. I started leaning over the edge of the boat, so not to lose it. That's when I lost my balance. I started wobbling tipping over the side of the boat, before my buddies, could reach out to grab me and reel me in. Bow in hand I crashed into the murky waters headfirst, getting absolutely soaked in the process. I can hear the guys in the boat laughing before I can even resurface, and when I finally do, I gotta admit, I was laughing too. 
but as I look up from the water, they don't look so cheerful anymore. They're all just looking behind me staring at something with these looks of terror on their faces. I'm all like, what? What's the problem? Before I looked behind me, seeing this pair of glassy eyes glowing in the lights of the boat, just before they disappear under the water. It was a gator. And it was huge. I started scrambling to get back on the boat, trying and failing to scale the side of it before the thing got me. All my buddies rushed to the side to try and grab me but the bow fishing instructor rushes to the opposite side, grabbing one of two of my friends and imploring them to do the same. Least we tip the whole thing over and all end up in the water. Just as they get a grip on me and start dragging me upwards. I feel like intense pressure on my right boot. It was horrible. I started screaming that it's got me. It's got me over and over, feeling my leg beginning to stretch from the guys dragging me up and the gator trying to drag me down. Then suddenly, I'm free. And the guys are able to pull me back up into the boat. But that didn't bring me any relief as in the moment. All I can think is how the gator had bitten my foot off. There was no pain, but I've heard in those adrenaline-fueled moments, you don't feel the massive injury that's been inflicted on you. I'm scrambling around the boat trying to get a look at my leg half expecting to see a missing foot and blood pouring out in the bottom of the boat. But to my instant relief, all I see is a soaking wet sock covering my still-attached foot. The relief the pure relief I felt in that moment I can hardly put into words. And it didn't take me all that long to figure out that a hangover had basically saved my life. Since I was feeling so rough that morning, I hadn't bothered to tie my boots up all that tight, giving them enough slack to allow the gator to straight up, pull it off my foot. It was without a doubt the single most terrifying moments of my entire life. Seeing that thing's eyes practically glowing and the floodlights the boat put the absolute fear of God into me. And I know how lucky I am that I was able to walk away from a situation with all my limbs still attached. I could just as easily bled to death lying on the floor of that boat thousands of miles away from my wife and kids, while my buddies looked on helplessly, we took a fair amount out of the swamps at nights, and I suppose it was only right that the swamps took something back. I didn't manage to catch the gar that I'd been lusting after in the end, but that was okay by me I guess. I'm just quick to remind myself that there are real-life monsters out there. Things that look like they're from a land before time, just watching and waiting for idiots like me to slip up figuratively, or in my case, literally. Back when I was pursuing my PhD in zoology at the UL Lafayette, I chose to write my thesis on the life cycle of biology of the alligator snapping turtle. This meant I spent an awful lot of time at the Archer Fallage and National Wildlife Refuge, a one million and a half acre area of hardwoods, swamps, lakes, and by us about 30 miles west of Baton Rouge. It's a truly beautiful and honor-inspiring place, but it's wild, one of those areas out in the country that has barely been conquered by humanity. And coming from Chicago, I never seen anything quite like it. But as much as I had come to love Archer Felisa, I had one of the worst experiences of my entire life whilst lost in the swamps there. An incident so intensely terrifying that I had to put my studies on pause for a matter of months in order to recover. I have decided to write down what I went through as a form of cognitive behavioral therapy in the hopes that it will help me deal with some of the unresolved traumas that follow me out of the swamps. Whether or not it will actually help I can't tell just yet, but I sincerely hope it does. As frankly, I've been unable to be completely happy or contented myself since it happened. So without further ado, this is my story. It all started the morning, my research partner and I were supposed to drive out to Archer Elia for a long day of study and observation. The weather had been absolutely abominable over the previous few weeks, and we picked a time during what appeared to be a brief break in the rainy season. That might be the only period for weeks where they would be feasible to undertake such a research trip. But in the morning, we were due to depart. I awoke to a text message saying he was feeling severely under the weather. He apologized, but told me that he wouldn't be able to accompany me. I was disappointed in the extreme, but like I said, the following few days looked like they would be the only time I'd be able to get a sizable chunk of research completed. 
So as foolish as it was, I loaded up my gear into my car and drove out into the swamps alone. Drove out to the small town of Plaque, I mean just on the edge of a Chafalaya. Parking up near a small mom and pop joint to get some riyads and grits before my hike into the swamps. I was in a pretty bad mood marching in there alone and I had to carry a little extra equipment since I couldn't spread the load with my research partner. This made the walk out to my preferred observation spot much more tiring than usual. I mean, it's crazy how just a little extra weight can make a long hike, like that seem harder. But anyway, I'm on my way out to a place called Upper Flat, a big stretch of water near little tents all by you, when all of a sudden, I started realizing that I don't recognize any of the terrain. This was weird, as I'd made this journey, like at least 50 times before, too many to really keep track of but I figured I've only strayed just a little off course. And I could find my way back onto my regular trail in no time. It was just a case of finding out which direction I'd move off in and making the appropriate course correction. Only when I get my compass out, I see the little needle spinning around wildly, like whirling around in a circle like it was being propelled by something. I give it a little tap, shaking it up, but it carries on doing exactly the same thing. It's not like it was a cheap compass either. It was a Sunto KB14 and they're some of the best compasses on the market. That one in particular sent me back almost 200 bucks. So my fall back on the compass on my iPhone, which is even less reliable, but works off a GPS as opposed to the Earth's natural magnetic forces. But again, not only does it refuse to calibrate, but I realized I have absolutely no bars on my phone either. That was definitely not normal. The cell reception isn't the best out there. But I always get something even if it's just a single bar to send texts. I'm a little worried by that point, as I basically got no method of reaching the outside world if something goes wrong, but it's either push on and get my day's research done. Or walk back the way I came and face, messing up my entire thesis. And I don't even know if the way I came will even take me back to plaque I mean by that point. So I foolishly decided it would be better to push on as opposed to turn back one of the single biggest mistakes in my life. So I'm walking for like another hour or so hopelessly lost in a place I somehow barely recognize when I begin to smell smoke coming through the trees. I figured it's some campers or hunters out there which would be highly unusual for the wet season but at least they'd be able to point me back in the direction of upper flat. I follow my nose as the smoky smell gets more and more intense until I start to see the smoke itself wafting through the trees. That's also about the time I begin to hear the slow rhythmic sounds of a banjo being plucked. Just out of sight is not some jolly occasion tune either. The sounds are discordant, ominous, even the hairs on the back of my neck begin to stand on end as I finally begin to see this little wooden shack coming into view. I can see the campfire, but that point and the sounds of the banjo are floating out of a small window in the shack. I'm nervous, but I speak up anyway calling out hello and asking if anyone has home. Even though I knew well that there is I was just trying to be polite, you know. This angry-looking face appears in the window, and an instant a face I'll never forget. This guy's skin looks like leather, all wrinkled and cracked, while the darkest eyes had ever seen started around from sunken eye sockets. He had a beard and mustache, but it was all dark, ratty, patchy hair that made him look more like a kind of vermin than a man. There was some rustling from inside, before the guys stumbled out from the shack's door, staring at me from the wooden steps. I apologized for my intrusion, then asked him if he knew which direction I could find up or flat. He didn't say a word at first just carried on staring me like I was somewhere I didn't belong, which I suppose was exactly the case. I then took to reassuring him that I didn't want to take up any of his time that I was a little lost and all I wanted was to find my way back towards little ten saw the detensor. He replied anadrol occasion French wheat, barley v long anglais. I picked up a little French since moving to Louisiana for school, but I'm not about to pretend it was any good. The man just shook his head and then said something that sounded like a question that included the word trade there. For those either don't know in Louisiana, a three terror is what they call someone who practices so-called faith healing. And his primary method of treatment involves what's known on as kind of a laying on of hands so to speak. 
is an important part of Creole and Cajun folk religion. The three Terra combines Catholic prayer, medicinal remedies, and occasionally voodoo rituals. Or at least I thought they did. I genuinely didn't think that there were any three tiers left, assuming the practice had long died out yet. Apparently not. Treat their GM boodle no. I asked with a chuckle and my terrible French trying to be as disarming as possible as to not irritate the man any further. He didn't laugh. He didn't smile. He just got mad. Really, really mad. He started growling things in French I didn't understand, pointing at me, accusatory Lee, as he seemed to get angrier and angrier. I started to back off, slowly at that point, hands raised in the air as if to say, I don't want any trouble. But somehow that just makes him even more irate. And then he's sort of apoplectic with rage as he pulls this huge gator jawbone knife from behind his back and starts pointing directly at me. A knife on its own would have been intimidating enough. But seeing the blunted alligator teeth made up the handle. Jesus that's just about scare the life out of me. I thought once I was out of there, I'd be okay. But as I'm walking back through the forest, pretty shaken up, he starts screaming in French and whistling. Only when I look over my shoulder, just to make sure he's not about to give chase. I noticed something that makes my blood run cold. He's not screaming on my back. He's not whistling at me either. He's screaming and whistling into the forest. It didn't quite hit me at first. I just peered over the back of my shoulder wondering what he was doing. But then I realized he was calling others telling them there was an intruder or whatever. I tried to move as quickly as I could without running. Don't get me wrong. I was absolutely terrified. But the bayou is not a place to go blindly sprinting among the greenery. Aside from gators and occasional cougar sightings, Louisiana is home to the cottonmouth snake. Although it's not outright deadly, their venom contains an anticoagulant, meaning the wound won't clot. Cotton mouth baits have been known to be fatal and without treatment, certainly require amputation. So I'm sort of jogging and bounding my way from the shack as fast as I can keep in my eyes on the ground, so I don't get myself bitten. I go for about 20 minutes or so until I'm happy. I'm far enough away from the angry Cajun to resume my walking pace. I felt exhaustion setting in at that point too. I'm sweating through my clothes, and I am completely and utterly lost. My compass and phone still aren't working at all and the further I walk, the more I'm panicking that I'm not going to be able to get out of the swamps by sundown. In which case, I would be really screwed. But just as I'm starting to feel relatively safe, I hear something like a twig snapping behind me. Before I get this horrible feeling in my gut, like someone is actually following me. I do a quick 360, making sure I can't see anyone which I don't. The bayou seemed to still and quiet as ever hit the filling didn't debate. I'm still convinced that someone is out there just beyond my vision. Watching me with unseen eyes. I started moving more quickly again bounding through the trees until I'm almost certain I can hear the sounds of a car driving in the distance. I was close to road, I was sure of it. But right as I start to move off in the direction of the sound, someone steps out from a tree just to the side of me. They were dressed in all black, bare-chested with red-brown skin that was riddled with strange-looking tattoos. Over their face was a mask that looked an awful lot like the front section of the human skull, and in their hand was a huge black blade of some kind. To this day, I have never seen anything as completely and utterly terrifying as whoever or whatever walked out from behind that tree. Whether or not they intended to do me harm or just scare me out of the area. I can't really say for certain, but I sure didn't want to wait to find out. I forgot about the cotton mouths and just ran as fast as I could. Sprinting through the trees as I heard the guy following me. It was horrifying. I could hear him panting, just a few meters behind me the whole way until I burst through this thick patch of bushes and onto the highway, behind it. I ran out in front of a car, which almost smashed into me honking its horn, with the driver going crazy. I ran around to the guy's driver's window and begged him to let me in. At first, he told me to screw off and almost drove off on me. But I begged the guy. 
I mean, I really begged, and I don't know if it was how haggard I looked, or who was the genuine terror in my voice. But eventually he agreed to let me in. I told him what went back down and that bayou, and I asked him if he'd ever seen or heard anything like that. He told me no, but also mentioned that he knew way better than to be walking around the bayou on his own like that. Then I was an idiot for doing it. He was kind enough to drive me back over the plaque I mean to where my car was parked. And I thanked him profusely for potentially saving my life. I offered him some gas money, but he told me no that there was no way he was about to take money off of me for just doing the right thing. That's something I never forgot about Louisiana. Just how kind and generous people could be. How the whole thing about Southern hospitality was very, very true. But I've also never forgotten about that man and the bone mask, the man who haunted my nightmares for months after and almost ruined my whole time at college since like I said, I had to put my studies on pause just to get over what I'd seen out there. So please, don't ever go walking into the by use of Louisiana alone, because there are people out there that are seriously averse to the intrusion of outsiders.